The Soviets were masters of deception and misinformation, especially when they wanted to hide their failures. Even though they may have denied that they were actively pursuing a manned lunar program in 1963, once the Cold War had formally ended in 1991, the rest of the world finally got to see the official government records and eyewitness accounts and discovered that the Soviets had a rather extensive manned lunar program. In fact, by the time Aldrin and Lovell flew the final Gemini mission in November 1966, the Soviet manned lunar program was well underway. By that time, they had designed a lunar orbiter named the LOK, which was based on the Soyuz capsule. Smaller than the Apollo Command Service Module, it was intended to carry a two-man crew to the moon and back. The Soviets had also designed a lunar lander, known as the LK. Much smaller than the Apollo Lunar Module, the LK was intended to carry a single cosmonaut down to the moon's surface and then return him to the lunar orbiter. And 18 cosmonauts, including Yuri Gagarin, Vladimir Komarov, and Alexei Lenev, were busy training for lunar flyby and lunar landing missions. Although the LOK itself never flew, many of the features proposed for that spacecraft were tested on various Zond missions. The LK, on the other hand, was tested on three Earth orbital flights. Even Jera acknowledges that Soviet achievement. How did they manage to smuggle the LK into orbit? Question. Why would the Soviets test a lunar lander if they never intended to use it? It doesn't make sense, does it? So then, other than radiation, what concerns could the Soviets have had about getting their cosmonauts safely to the moon and back? Well, getting them off the ground alive would be the first major concern. The vehicle intended to carry the Soviet cosmonauts to the moon was the N-1 rocket. This was the largest launch vehicle that the Soviets had ever designed and built, and managed to keep secret for over 20 years. Compared to the Saturn V, this rocket had nearly 50% more thrust in its first stage, and it had 30 engines compared to the five rocket engines on board the S-1C. Six times more complex, six times more things to go wrong, and skilled workers who were paid equally poorly regardless of how well they did their jobs. Is it any wonder that all four of the unmanned N-1 launches were spectacular failures? There are some minor differences in the detailed accounts of these launches, but the Reader's Digest version goes like this. Just 10 days before Apollo 9 began its Earth orbital mission, the first N-1 launch, 3L, lifted off the launch pad. But shortly after launch, high-frequency oscillations caused a pipe to burst, filling the Block A engine bay with fire. 69 seconds into the launch, the rocket exploded. Then, two weeks before Apollo 11 set out on its successful flight to the moon, the second N-1 launch, 5L, ended before the rocket could even clear the tower when a bolt was sucked into the fuel pump of engine number 8. The ensuing explosion not only destroyed the rocket, but launch pad 110 East as well. It took 18 months before the launch pad was operational again. The third launch, 6L, cleared the pad, but shortly after that it went into an uncontrolled roll and was deliberately detonated 51 seconds after it lifted off. Then, just four days before the Soyuz 11 mission ended in disaster, the fourth N-1 launch, 7L, became the victim of pogo oscillations, which caused premature engine cutoff and the subsequent explosion of engine number four. Being the longest N-1 mission, this rocket disintegrated 106 seconds after liftoff and just six seconds before the Stage 1 burnout and ignition of Stage 2 were to occur. So, could the fact that a cosmonaut would have a better chance of survival playing Russian roulette with a loaded gun than climbing aboard an N-1 rocket have any bearing on why the Soviets never put a man on the moon? The Soviets obviously had much bigger problems to worry about than radiation. Which brings us back to my original question. If the Soviets knew that the radiation from space would instantly kill their cosmonauts, as Jera and other conspiracists suggest, why did they even have a manned lunar program? And if the Soviets knew that the Apollo program was a hoax, why didn't they just fake their manned lunar program as well? Think about it. Who would call their bluff? If the U.S. was to come out and say that a manned Soviet space flight outside the Van Allen belt was impossible, how could they possibly continue with the Apollo program? 
All the Soviets needed to do was fly an empty spacecraft around the moon and bring it back before Apollo 8, and then claim there were cosmonauts on board. Using Jera's logic, since the Soviets used a different radio frequency than the U.S., no one would be able to pick up their radio communications to know if anyone was on board or not, right? What could possibly stop the Soviets from parading their supposed moon men around the world in triumph? The U.S. couldn't very well call foul if the Soviets could turn around and expose them for doing the same thing, could they? And the conspiracists claim that the U.S. was blackmailing the Soviets to keep quiet, that the U.S. threatened a wheat embargo if the Soviets should disclose what they knew about the fake Apollo missions, is an anachronism at best. The U.S. didn't sell much of anything to the Soviets in the 60s. The first major wheat deal was cut between Nixon and Brezhnev months after the first SALT talks, which were in May 1972, just four months before the Apollo program ended. How could an embargo that late in the game keep the Soviets from spilling the beans before 1969? Well, what about Carter's 1980 wheat embargo in response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan? Wouldn't that have been an ideal time to counter-blackmail the U.S.? Why didn't the Soviets say, Lift the embargo now, or we go to the world with what we know about your moon hoax. We know radiation would have killed your astronauts, and we've got the data to prove it. All they had to do was present evidence that the biological samples that they sent around the moon came back in a bloody mess, and they would have gotten the world's attention. The U.S. could not very well accuse them of lying if they had data to back up their claims. NASA didn't have every scientist in the world in their back pockets, and these scientists would believe data if it existed. Instead, how did Brezhnev react to the embargo? He went off and bought wheat from Argentina. As the result of that embargo, U.S. farms failed and went under, but the Soviets, who had to go without wheat for several months, never said a word about the moon hoax. Why? So, at the end of the day, Jera is unable to justify his brash claim that the Soviets saw radiation as an unmovable obstacle to putting man on the moon. Nowhere in his Exhibit D series does Jera give any evidence that the Apollo astronauts could not survive a 10-day trip to the moon and back. If I were to pull a Jera, I might accuse him of committing a fallacy of omission for leaving out all the fine details. All his flawed calculations, his outdated expert testimonies, his irrelevant data. Instead, I realized that Jarrah could fill a 20-part series with that kind of nonsense. Hmm. I wonder if his radiation series is any better thought out than his Exhibit D series was. <laughs> Ciao, moon hoax conspirators. Wherever you are.